And inshallah, without any further ado, I would like to invite to the podium our next guest speaker, uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad. But before he does come on to the podium, uh, just a brief, uh, a brief uh, background um, to give you an understanding of who this great personality uh, we have before us um, today. Um, for most of you, uh, you who will be aware of Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, uh, he doesn't need a great detailed introduction. Uh, he is a lecturer at the University of Cambridge. He has uh, founded Cambridge Muslim College, uh, which uh, trains up imams uh, and scholars. Um, so he's a founder of that. He's, again, he's a teacher. And most importantly, recently, there was an uh, education institute, a research center in Jordan that has uh, published the 500 Muslim. Now, this 500 Muslim is a combination of all the 500 influential Muslims around the world. And Alhamdulillah, Thumma Alhamdulillah, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad is the 50th most influential Muslim individual in the world. So Alhamdulillah, we have him before us. And I would like to invite him without any further ado, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala khatamil anbiya wal mursaleen Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina wa shafi'ina wa ismati amrina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa atba'ihi ajma'in ila yawmiddin Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directs us many times in his revelation to be joyful qul bi fadlillahi wa bi rahmatihi fa bi dhalika falyafrahu huwa khayrun mimma yajma'un just to take one example it is a commandment that we should be joyful when we hear about the arrival of Allah's blessings, we should smile and not look grumpy. We should rejoice and not look glum. Because Al-Ihtifalu bi dhikrin ni'ami wajib, the title of the book of one of my teachers, it is an obligation to celebrate blessings. After all, of all of the blessings which come to us in this world, and 99.9% .9 of them we don't even notice, the beating of our hearts, the breaths that we draw, the oxygen in the air, the fact that the earth is stable beneath our feet and that the oxygen and the atmosphere keep the gamma rays away from our brains. All of these are Allah's mercies, mercies that he bestows not just upon the ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but upon the other ummahs and upon the animals and upon the grass and upon the very planet on which we stand. This is the nature of our Lord. He is our Rahman. We worry about our condition. If we are looking for a way out of our condition, if we are looking for a way of escaping from these shadows and finding the light again, we can rejoice because ours is not an ideology. Sometimes people speak of Islam as an ideology without ever bothering to look it up in the dictionary. Ours is a deen rooted in something that actually happened. The communists and the capitalists, they dream about something on the basis of nothing that's ever been achieved. They just hope that they will produce the ideal society at some point in the future, and they end up just producing more misery for human beings. al takathur is really the slogan both of the capitalists and the communists, and it doesn't help at all. It hasn't worked. But in the case of the, uh, the deen of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we find not a theory but a practice, something that has actually been achieved. We can open the pages of the seerah and we can see an extraordinary transformation that actually happened before people's eyes, taking them from the shadows into the light, taking them from the many to the one, taking them from pessimism about death to optimism about eternal life, taking them from tribal, tribal feuds, revenge, honor killing, killings, intiqam, to a state in which they were all equal under one united law. An extraordinary transformation. We know that it can be done because it has happened. If we look at our condition and we look for a way in which we can improve our condition, and alhamdulillah, there are many good things in our communities as well as, as, well as many problematic issues, 
We are optimistic because we know it can be done. And if we look elsewhere in our history, we can see that it has been done, albeit in a minor key, because nobody can replicate the greatness of the achievement of the Chosen One, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That was an ideal that inspires us, but we can't repeat it exactly. But we can at least be inspired by it. We see again and again, mujaddids of this ummah, bringing something of that extraordinary illumination to situations of extraordinary darkness. Now when we look at our situation here, and we look for way f ways forward, we begin with this assurance that indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can change a dark situation into a luminous situation and can take people out of shadows into blazing light. But we also know that the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is uh, still the guide of this ummah. And what this means is something that has dazzled the minds. And the ulama say that it's best not to look into this in any kind of logical detail. When we think about uh, the Holy Prophet وسلم, in the pure earth of Medina, what that reality could be is something that dazzles our minds and we lower our gaze and we cannot begin to think about what that reality might be. But we do know that in his state in the Barzakh, the Rasul وسلم, continues to be the founder of the Ummah, the inspirer of the Ummah, and at the end of time we have the assurance that he will be the intercessor for this Ummah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect this ummah to the extent that we protect reverence for the founder of this ummah in our hearts. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ Allah will not punish them for as long as you are amongst them. And he will not punish them for as long as they make istighfar. And the great sheikhs of Islam will always say, if you have these two things, if you have love for the Holy Prophet ﷺ in your heart, not just doing the commandments, but real love behind the commandments, the spirit that gives life to the body of your actions. Uh, and if you combine this with istighfar, which is the basic state of Islam, which is um, saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I know that uh, I commit in every day more sins than I could ever enumerate, but you are al-ghaffar, you are the forgiving. If you have those two things, then you can be the beginning of a movement within the Ummah that can start to gain from the light that was there at the beginning of this Ummah, because that light has not been extinguished. With a passage into the Barzakh of the Chosen One, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that nur remains in a mysterious way, flowing in the hearts of everybody who is truly a warith Muhammadi, that is to say, somebody who is truly an inheritor of the Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, maybe in his nasab, maybe in his ilm. Maybe in his adab, maybe in his ihsan, there's so many ways in which that light can be inherited. Sometimes tiny little sparks from that extraordinary blinding blazing sun of the prophetic heart, the heart on which the word of Allah itself could be sent down, an unimaginable human reality. Nazalahu ala qalbik, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, he sent it down on your heart. Yeah? And that is the beginning of this light and part of the unimaginable nature of the prophetic greatness. If we sent this Qur'an down on a mountain, you would see it shattered into pieces from the fear of Allah. But where was the Qur'an sent down? He sent it upon your heart. So what is his heart? What could that be? It's beyond our imagination. We know the state of our own heart and occasionally perhaps it has glimpses of things and dreams and moments of, of spiritual upliftment but we do not really know what it is to have a heart that is strong enough and pure enough, a pure reflected mirror to carry Kalamullah al-Qadim, Allah's uncreated speech, that which is in its nature from the divine nature. آيات حق من الرحمن محدثة قديمة صفة الموصوف بالقدم As the poet says, signs uh, from الرحمن renewed through the revelation in غير حراء renewed قديمة because uncreated Their quality is the quality of the one who has no beginning And again we know that this shatters the mind We cannot imagine what it means to say the uncreated book but we do know that that book, which has something of the quality of the uncreated about it, came down upon his heart, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when we speak of him and we speak of the light that was sent with him and the light that came through him, we're talking about no ordinary light. 
We're not just talking about knowledge or information or wisdom. We're talking about something, something ancient, something uncreated. We know that because it is uncreated, it can never be put out. It can never be extinguished. It is there permanently. So it's the requirement of every Muslim who seeks the happiness that was visible upon the face of the early Muslims, who seeks the happiness and the peace that is upon the face of those who are not interested in what people are collecting, but are only interested in being right with their point of origin and their point of destination. The only sensible attitude a human being could be to be in touch with this light. What can one say about light? Well, pure light is something that is something to do with unity. Like unity, you can't divide it. It's hard to describe it. To the extent that it's pure, it's beyond any kind of categorization. But we do know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set up this creation as an alternation of opposites. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his wisdom has decreed that behind the various complex forms of creation and uh, subhanallah, what a complex and beautiful creation it is. مَا تَرَى فِي خَلْقِ الرَّحْمَانِ مِنْ تفاوت. You don't see any defect in the creation of the All-Merciful. We find that this opposition of light and the shadows is there repeatedly in his book. اللَّهُ وَلِيُّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا يُخْرِجُهُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النور. Allah is the wali, the protecting friend of those who have iman. He takes them out of the shadows into the light. Now the shadows, zulumat in the Qur'an, they come in the plural always because the things of the world, the aghyar, the things that are other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are so many. They're not infinite, only he is infinite. The universe has boundaries, although they're far away, but it is finite. The universe does not go on forever. The universe does not extend forever in space. It is bounded. It is mahsur. But it's made up of these shadows. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Nuru samawati wal ard, the light and the heavens of the heavens and the earth. And this light flows through creation. And how does it flow through creation? It flows through creation in the form of what we might describe as the, the purity of Rahmah. That the scholars say that if you go less than uh, an infinitesimal distance behind the surface of things, you find the Rahmah. The ground of being is Rahmah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the world as an expression of his rahmah, as an expression of his mercy. He has no need for this world. He has no need of anything. Why did he create the world? Even the question, again, staggers the mind. He created the world so that in his mercy there might be uh, manifestations of his mercy. And so that the greatest mercy that we might experience, which is to recognize the source of that mercy, might be possible in the world. In other words, creation of the world so that there might be somebody in the world that recognizes this mercy and therefore wants to worship him. That's what it's all about from a particular perspective. Of course to ask why Allah does things is to make Allah into something like ourselves which he can't be. But some of our poets and some of our thinkers have said this is a helpful way of doing it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the world out of his mercy so that the supreme manifestation of his mercy in the world should be something that is one of the aghyar, that is other than him, but recognizes his mercy so perfectly that he is in this state of obudiyya. So the reason for the creation of the universe is li'abudun, so that they might worship me. Now, in this creation, everything is on a certain level submissive to him. Kullu lahu Everything is prostrate to him because of the way in which it is. It's made up of atoms. The atoms are completely subject to his command in every instant. Nothing can withstand his command. But at the same time, amongst these beings, there are those whose inward mystery of the ruh and the irada are consciously submitted, are consciously surrendering. That is to say, they are not just in this state of obudiyya, this complete slavehood, just because of the qahr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but because of the mystery of the ruh within them. And again, the ruh is something that's difficult for us to understand. But this does seem to make sense. There's some things that are submitted to him by their nature. There are other things that have within them the mystery of submitting through what they want, through having some kind of choice, through recognizing the perfection of their maker and saying, uh, bala shahidna, Yes, we bear witness, as they did at the beginning of their conscious existence. 
So there are these levels in which creatures are submissive to their Lord. There are the unconscious submitters and there are the conscious submitters. And amongst the conscious submitters, which is basically the jinn and the ins, the righteous amongst them, we find that there are degrees. And the highest of the highest is one position which is occupied only by the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is the Sayyidul Abideen. He is the master of the worshippers. His submission to his Lord is more conscious, more aware, more perfect than the submission to the Lord of any other order of creation. And this is one reason why it is said of him, Rahmatul lil alameen, wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatul lil alameen, doesn't just mean that his sharia was a mercy to people who are savages and brought them out of the shadows into light. It doesn't just mean that it's a guide for those who are confused about how they should live their lives, from how they should be at home to how they should run a government. It doesn't just mean that, it has an inner meaning as well, which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whose nature is mercy, and who has built this creation out of mercy, has appointed in this creation one who shows the purpose of existence. The reason for the creation of existence is most clear in him. لَوْلَاكَ مَا خَلَقْتُ الْأَفْلَاكَ as it is said, but for you, I wouldn't have created the, the heavens, as it is said to the Holy Prophet wasallam. And it is in that that he is at the highest level, rahmatul lil alameen, mercy to the worlds. Because what is a more perfect manifestation that brings the mercy, which sometimes in our muddy world seems hidden within the nature of things and some things we experience as being other than mercy because we don't understand what they truly are. Who is the one who brings that hidden mercy to the surface most perfectly, who is pure mercy? It is none other than Sayyidina Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. So when we speak of this time of the year, and when we think of that place in the world where he was born, and also the place in the world from which he was raised up to the presence of his Lord in the Isra. And when we think of the place in this world where he is buried, we understand why those are the three holiest places on earth. It is because those are the places where Rahma uh, was most perfectly displayed to those who had eyes to see. Of course, some people, they're almost born blind and they can't see. Abu Lahab could not see, but Bilal could see. And this is the revolution that he brings, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It has nothing to do with education, or birth, or tribe, or status, or prestige, whether you drive a big car, or whether you go on the bus, it makes no difference at all. What counts is the softness of the heart that is looking for mercy. Human beings are looking for light, which means that they are looking for mercy. So some, particularly the broken-hearted, the mustad afin, looked at the Holy Prophet wasallam, and they saw Rasulullah. Others, with pride and darkness in their hearts, which were uh, like stones or even harder looked at him and they saw Yatim Abi Talib Abu Talib's orphan that's all that they could see so another thing that we need to learn when we consider this time of the year is softness of heart if we have hard hearts and we claim to be celebrating the Mawlid there's something wrong we can't see that this Farah which is commanded in this ayah is to do with something that is to do with the tenderness of our humanity. Our weaker times, our most open times, uh, our most vulnerable times, where we are most real about our own weakness and about our own fears, about our own awareness of mortality, our brokenness, it is with those hearts that we can see and it is those who have those hearts who can see something of the greatness of the Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sometimes people come to me and they ask why it is that the Muslims are weak in today's world. And I say to them that uh, it is not surprising that the wealthy, that the super rich, that the press barons, that the media barons, that the presidents and the prime ministers and the ministers and all of those plutocrats only see Yatim Abi Talib, if they even think about him at all, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because their hearts are like rocks. Because they're busy with mayaj ma'un, with what they're gathering. All they can see is Yatim Abi Talib. But it's the poorer people and the weaker people and the taxi drivers and the people who are flipping burgers and working in kebab shops and doing simple things in the world whose hearts are soft and who 
when they hear of the Holy Prophet وسلم, and they hear the story of his life and they hear people singing out of love for him and they consider what he did and how he lived for the poor and with the poor and transformed the condition of the poor, not just theorizing but living their life, that their hearts are softened and they are the ones who are joyful in this season. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent this message with, as it were, the, the, the blessed words, I am with the brokenhearted. It was the brokenhearted, it was the weak, it was the children, it was the widows, it was the orphans, it was the despised, the marginalized of Makkah who came to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, while the rich and the powerful and the wealthy held back. Now, it's not that they're beyond hope. You can see some of the great Sahaba like Sayyidina Omar, radiallahu an, Sayyidina Uthman, were also from fortunate backgrounds. But the essential nature of being weak and being poor and being despised uh, is to be humble and to be confused and to be not very happy with the way the dunya is. And it is those people who, from that brokenness, from the softness of their hearts, can see the greatness of the Chosen One, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some of you might have noticed that uh, the census returns from 2011 have been assessed by the government and the figures for religious adherents were published just two weeks ago. And everybody was baffled because they saw that the percentage of people just in the last 10 years calling themselves Christians has gone down by 14%. That's a historic, extraordinary collapse. But the percentage of people in Britain calling them, themselves Muslims has increased by 70% which is an extraordinary, unprecedented increase, despite the fact that immigration has been pushed down and down and it's harder to get visas and even students find it hard to get here. Still, the Ummah uh, of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is increasing in number. And we need to recall that it is probably the nature of uh, religion in Europe as we look uh, to the next few years and the next few decades that faith will be primarily Muslim faith. There was even a blog on the Daily Telegraph uh, website which said that probably the number of people who go to Juma every week in England is greater than the number of people who go to church in England every week. That's the nature of how things are. And the rich and the powerful and the media moguls and the people who do cartoons and other things may despise us and insult us and poke us in the eye. Islamophobia continues to grow. But we're not put out by that. We're not surprised by that because we know that the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also experienced the other. Fasbir ala adahum, he is told, just put up with their insults and their Islamophobia. That's just the nature of things. The powerful will always despise the powerless. The rich will always look down on the poor, make them feel less guilty that way. Uh, the haves despise the have-nots. And this is the nature of today's world that light and love and rahmah are with the true followers of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and greed, hard-heartedness, environmental <laughs> depredation uh, and a defiance of the decrees of heaven are with the wealthy and the powerful. And we need to be at ease with this rather than resentful. We need to recognize that this is how things have to be because the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the poor shall be resurrected before the rich by 500 years. And he also prayed to be resurrected amongst the Mesakin, amongst the poor. And this is how it is, not just with him, alayhi salatu wasalam, but with all of the Anbiya and with all of the Awliya and with the true Ulama of this Ummah. That is their option, preferential option for being with the poor. And in a world in which money is all that exists, ma'yaj ma'on is all they care about, that makes no sense at all, but that's just too bad. We see people constantly coming towards us. And what we need to do in order to help them to come into our ranks, to join our masajid, and there aren't enough of them. We may claim to be lovers of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but the dawah, which was his most spectacular achievement in his society, is something that we are failing to do, because we see that the masajid are not full of new Muslims, by and large, is to remember that if we truly claim to be celebrating the mawlid of the chosen one, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there should be consequences. If we truly are rejoicing in Allah's blessing that the Holy Prophet والسلام, has been sent to us, uh, then that blessing should manifest itself in a joy that others see. Why is this person so happy? People at work should be asking us. Why doesn't he have problems at home? People at work should be asking us. And then they start to ask questions and they find out 
about the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why these milad processions, for instance, through the streets, if they're done well, can be a very important form of da'wah. People are curious, everybody's interested in anniversaries, they want to know what this is about. That's your opportunity to tell, to tell them about the Chosen One, alayhi salatu wasalam. So these old institutions, which have been sanctioned by our ulama, need to be given new life and strengthened, particularly by our young people, as vehicles for da'wah. Because there's no sharia justification for being here if you're not bringing other people into Islam. And the way of Islam is always to grow because this light which was sent with him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, cannot be kept in a box. It has to be opened and shared with everybody. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a share of that mysterious prophetic light, to feel the light of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in our gatherings and in everything that we do, and to be guided by the light of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to a full conformity to his sunnah and a full love of his law and a full love of humanity, not in what they are at the moment, but in what they are called to become. Because every one of them is made ultimately in the shape of Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam, and each one of them deserves guidance. Each one of them has a th heart that is thirsting for this light. And if we are not going to bring that light to them, then who on this earth is going to bring it to them? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us about our neighbors and about our friends and about our colleagues. Ask us very severely whether we shared this light with them and told them about the chosen one, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, especially at this time of year, or whether we kept it in the box of something secret and private that's to do with our community that we think really has nothing to do with other people. That is a question that we will certainly be asked. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit from this light and to make us spreaders of this light and to complete this light in this age, inshallah, so that we can enter the grave and experience light and inshallah have at the yawm al-qiyamah the shafa'ah of the man of light, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so that we enter paradise, inshallah, without any reckoning amongst the anbiya and have the blessing of the presence of the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, abad al-abad for all eternity. بارك الله فيكم والعفو منكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله